Abraham was counted righteous because he believed God. We're counted righteous when we believe in Jesus Christ. And as believers, Jesus grants us power and authority through his name. So how do we see that power and authority manifested in our daily lives? That's coming up straight ahead as Arkansas Live starts right now. I want to encourage you to get your copy of The Believer's Authority. Uh, we'll show you a little spot at the end of the broadcast, so stay tuned uh, and be sure and write down the information so you can order the book, The Believer's Authority, and the workbook. Oh, I'll tell you, this will make a big difference in your authority level. Okay, let's pick up where we left off yesterday. We stopped reading in John chapter 8. Now remember, we're talking about authority, identity, and power all this week. And we started with Abraham. Abraham, excuse me, Abraham believed God and it was imputed or reckoned to him for righteousness with God. Through Christ, Galatians 3.29, we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Abraham was the first Jew because he believed God. He established faith is believing what God said. He's our father in the faith. He is the father of the Arabs, father of the Jews, father of the Christians. He is our father of faith because he believed God. So he built the platform, the foundation for believing God. And through Christ, we become the spiritual children of Abraham. We're not the natural DNA descendants of Abraham, but we are Abraham's children. Now, and let me just say this, if you watch yesterday's program, and I hope I don't confuse you even more, just because you're a genealogy DNA Jew doesn't necessarily guarantee you the blessings of Abraham because the blessings of Abraham came upon Abraham because he believed God. And the blessing of Abraham comes on you as a Christian because you believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, the man that wrote this book that I read from uh, yesterday, One New People, and uh, he's a Jewish believer. He's born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaks in other tongues, but his name is Epstein. He is a DNA uh, Jewish man uh, but he didn't receive any of the blessings of Abraham until he became a believing believer. <laughs> he became born again. I mean, I, I, let me read you some, some more of his statements here. Someone can be a DNA Jew, but still not be Abraham's child according to the covenant blessing. Are you getting this? Uh, let me read it again. You can be a DNA Jew, genealogy. You can be a DNA Jew and still not be Abraham's child according to the covenant blessing. Hmm. However, all of Abraham's true children are Jews. And you have to remember our scripture in Romans 2, 29, where it talked about the fact that we are not Jews outwardly, but we are Jews spiritually. According to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, we are the redeemed. Your, your name will never become Epstein. Your, your, your family will never become, quote, Jewish by DNA unless you are a DNA Jew, but you're not going to take, partake of the blessings of God until you become spiritually the offspring of Abraham. You get what I'm saying? He, he goes on to say here, uh, let me read another statement. It's really, really powerful. He, he makes some real bold statements about uh, being uh, Jewish. Who was the first Jew? Uh, the first Jew was Abraham, and all Jews came from him and are his children. Yet you are not a spiritual Jew inwardly until you get born again. And when you become born again, you become Christ's. You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, now we find this discussion 
in John's gospel, John chapter eight. Let's pick it up where we left off yesterday. After Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the knowledge of the truth will make you free. They answered him and said, we are Abraham's seed and we're not in bondage to any man. So how can you say the truth will make you free? Now, see, they were talking natural seed of Abraham. They were talking about their genealogy, their DNA. Wow, we're the children of Abraham. No, they weren't. Not unless they believed in Jesus. They were the descendants of Abraham. They were his physical genealogy DNA. Go on, let's read. Go on and let's keep reading. Uh, we're Abraham's seed, never in bondage to any man. Well, they were in bondage to Rome at the, at the particular time this was written. Verily I say unto you, whosoever commits sin. And then, and then let's go down to verse 30, verse 39. And Jesus answered them and said, excuse me, they answered Jesus and said, Abraham is our father. <laughs> and Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now, see, they're talking natural. Jesus is talking spiritual. I'm trying to lay a foundation for you, for your authority. If you don't understand your authority and where you came from and how your authority was established, then you are not going to operate in the power of God. Keep reading now with me. He said, you are not the uh, children of Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man which told you the truth, which I've heard of God. This did not Abraham. The deeds of your father, then said they unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now listen to this. This was a slap in their face. You are of your father, the devil. Whoa. <laughs> You're of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They did not comprehend what he was trying to get across to him, to them. He was trying to follow up on the fact that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto them, uh, him righteous. But here's Jesus now. And they could not receive Jesus because they would not believe upon him. And so Jesus was just trying to say they didn't understand it. And possibly some of you don't understand it. He was trying to let them know you're not going to become, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, you're not going to become the spiritual DNA of Abraham until you believe in me, Jesus said. If you believe in me, Jesus said, then you'll become Abraham's seed. In other words, you become Abraham's children. You become his descendants spiritually. And the circumcision of the heart in the spirit is the sign that you are a child of God. You know, the circumcision on the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, was a sign Everybody that was circumcised, it was a sign of the covenant. But today, it says in Romans 2.29 that the circumcision of the spirit, of the heart, is the sign that you are the spiritual child of Abraham, the spiritual descendant. You are the redeemed. You used to be a Gentile, which is a non-Jew, but now you're the redeemed and you've made, been made an heir of the blessings of Abraham, of the authority of Abraham through Jesus Christ. Now, if you can figure all that out, if, you, if the Holy Spirit can give you understanding of that, you'll be a powerhouse, so to speak. You will understand your authority. You will understand that when you lay hands on the sick and you command that sickness to leave, they have to leave because you're a child of Abraham you're a son of the Most High. When you speak to poverty and lack and tell it to go, 
you'll understand your authority in Christ makes you a child of Abraham. Now, let, let me pull up some more scriptures over here. Let's go to Acts chapter 28. I don't know if I marked that or not. Acts chapter 28. Yeah, let's look at verse 22 through 24. And uh, I want to make this statement to you. All believers are not the same. Everybody that says they're a believer is not a believer. You have to be a believing believer. Look at Acts 28, 22. We des- now, they may be a believer in Jesus Christ, but they're not a believer of everything that Jesus taught. Uh, Acts 28, 22. But we desire to hear of you and what you think for us concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him to his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. Now, they all claim to be descendants of Abraham. They all claim to be, uh, you know, children of Abraham. They all believe, claim, claim to be believers in God. But some of them believe what Jesus said and some of them didn't. So everybody that professes to be a believer is not, and this is just my way of saying it, they are not believing believers. They are unbelieving believers. <laughs> Go to Acts 19, Acts chapter 19, and let's look at verses 1 through 7. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, uh, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much as even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. We don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, what were you baptized under? And they said, well, under John's baptism. With the baptism of repentance. Saying unto the people, they should believe on him which should come after him. That's on Christ. Then they heard this. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he laid his hands upon them, the Holy Holy Ghost came upon them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, these, these, these guys were believers, but they were believers of John the Baptist but they did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they had not heard. So you could say they were unbelieving believers. How many believers, quote, believe in Christ, go to church, Christians? How many believers have you found in your Christian life that don't believe everything that's in the Bible? So you could say in some cases they are unbelieving believers. They're believers, but they don't believe everything. And most of them don't believe they have any authority at all. Um, You know, this is the the sad uh, part about Christians today that don't believe they have any authority. And when you tell them they do, they look at you kind of funny and they think, well, who do you think you are? You're trying to show your power and authority or you know more than I do or you're smarter than me or you're more holy than I am. No, no trying to get you to believe for yourself. As a pastor for over 37 years, I used to tell our congregation, I would say, you know, I, I really want you, the, the, the believer, the Christian in the pew, I really want you to exercise your authority. That's my whole purpose is to get you to the point where you, you exercise your authority in the Bible. If you don't know you have authority, then I can teach you that you definitely have it. But then you have to identify with yourself in Jesus. And then you have to use the authority that he gave you. Remember what Jesus said before he left? He said, I give unto you power to do what? To tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And I used to tell the congregation, I want you to walk in your power and authority. 
You don't need to bring me any problems. You pray. You exercise your authority over those demons. You exercise your authority over the sickness and the disease. That was my whole purpose was to teach and grow the body up so that they would become perfect. Go, go over to Ephesians. Uh, pastors, if you're listening here, this is, this is really the purpose of your whole ministry. In Ephesians 4.11, God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Your job is to feed and perfect the saints. Why? So the saints can do the work of the ministry. That's the purpose. The church is to be a powerhouse. It's to be a body of authority in the earth. And he gave some, all these gift ministries to perfect the saints. The pastor can't perfect the saints all alone. You have to have the other fivefold ministry involved. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man mature, the measure of faith, measure the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. But the church has to become mature. It has to become the authority. It has to become the power. I think I saw on CBN News last week, I'm not, I don't know if I can recall the exact facts or figures, but I think I heard on the CBN News right here on VTN last week, the big uh, March for Life or demonstration, pro-life demonstration that they had in New York and the quote fake media reported that there were four or five thousand, I mean four or five hundred supporters and they said there were thousands of protesters and just a few hundred supporters. That was a lie. The actual facts were there were thousands of supporters of life and only a few hundred uh, scoffers. But that's, that's the church's prerogative. That's our point. That's our privilege. That's our purpose is to be salt and light. But if you don't know your authority... You, you won't ever do anything that magnifies the Lord and, and stands against the wiles of the devil. We've got far more people in America that be, believe in pro-life than believe in pro-death. The biggest, the biggest block of believers of pro-abortion and pro-death is the media. They're the ones that are trying to sell the pro-abortion and the pro-death. Pro when in reality, there's thousands and millions of Americans that believe in pro-life. And you see the tables are turning, and that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that their agenda is going to be overwhelmed and overcome and overturned. I'm talking about the pro-death, the pro-abortion. -pro but it will if the church understands its authority and stands up and produces light and salt against the darkness. The media does everything they can do to discredit, to disfame, to discourage the pro-life stance, the senators, the representatives, the preachers, the, everybody. They, they, just, they just constantly knock them down, uh, challenge them, uh, speak ill of them, threaten them. It's, it's just a minor uh, level of terrorism when you see these journalists and publications and magazines and newspapers and television, when you see them attacking the pro-life stance and the pro-life people, it's, it's terrorism. It's trying to instill fear. But the church has no reason to fear. The church is God's authority in the earth. And, of course, when you start saying stuff like that, you get criticized and made fun of and, you know, all put down. But that's all right. At least we're doing exactly uh, what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, let's go over to Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9, and let's start reading with verse 17. And one of the multitude answered, said, Master, I've brought unto you my son, which has a dumb spirit. Um, 
and wherever he takes him, he tears him and foams and gnashes with his teeth and pines away. He looks like he's dead. I've seen that. Uh, and they, I spoke to your disciples. They could not cast him out, uh, that they'd cast him out, and they could not. And he said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I suffer you? Bring him to me. They brought him to him. When he saw him, they straight away, the, the demon spirit tore him. He fell on the ground wallowing, foaming. He had an epileptic fit. And he said to, he asked his father, how long is it since this came unto him? He said, of a child. He said, oftentimes it's cast him into the fire, the waters to destroy him. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And here's what Jesus said. Listen to this. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you can believe, what, 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 what does believe mean? Belief comes from two words, be, which means to live or exist, lifan, L-I-F-A-N, to live in agreement with something. Belief requires action. Oh, I like that. Belief means to live in agreement with something. And in the scripture says, I, th I think it's in Amos, but it says, <clears throat> how can two walk together unless they be agreed? How can you and God walk together unless you agree? How can you believe if you don't agree with what God said? Yeah, but Pastor Carl, well, that's not the way our denomination teaches it. Wait a minute. Forget your denomination for a moment. What does the Bible say? Denominations, <laughs> denominations sometimes um, create unbelief. They help people falter and fail. They confuse. You know, Charles Capps used to always say, you know, you had to have, you had to have help to develop that much unbelief. So sometimes religion is harmful. It, it's not a blessing because it's not teaching you the right thing. It's teaching you doctrines and traditions of men. Study the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Anybody else's word for it. Get in the word for yourself. Study what the Bible says and believe that. So belief means to live in agreement with God. Do you believe what the Bible says? Then walk on that. Live on that. Conduct your affairs on that. Uh, if you go over to Matthew 17, you're going to see uh, a similar reference uh, to belief and unbelief. Uh, let's see. Matthew 17. And let's go to verse 14. Matthew 17, 14. And when the multitude were come to him, there came a certain man kneeling down to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son for he's lunatic, moonstruck, and sore vexed. And let me just say this right now. You know, I, I, I used to teach this in our Bible college, demons and, demons and deliverance. Lunatic means moonstruck. Now I've had, I've had friends, still have friends on the police force, Little Rock police force. And uh, the police officers verified to me, and I'd ask them, I said, do you have more crime when there's a full moon? I said, yeah, we do. Lunatic, moonstruck. Satan takes advantage of superstitions. Now, we're talking about authority, identity, and power. And we're going to continue with this tomorrow. So be sure and join me. Right now, I want to show you how you can get your copy of the workbook and the textbook on the Believer's Authority. I'll be right back. From the beginning of creation to the ministry of Jesus and throughout the church age, no message has been more revolutionary, life-changing, or misunderstood than that of the Believer's Authority. Pastor Happy Caldwell has tackled this complex teaching in his new book and spirit-led Bible study, Believer's Authority. In this powerful duo, he reveals how you, a believer in Christ, can use your own kingdom authority to release God's healing power, set captives free from Satan's snares, 
overcome the spirits of fear, depression, and poverty, and perform miracles in the mighty name of Jesus. To order your very own Believer's Authority book and Bible study, call toll-free 1-800-264-2525. The book is just $14.99, and the Bible study is only $19.99. The spiritual battle is real, but through these powerful, time-tested scriptural principles, you can be a victor instead of a victim. When you get these materials and you study them, read them, and it becomes a part of your life, what, what are you going to do when your child comes down with 108 degrees temperature? What are you going to do when uh, the bank uh, says that you don't have any more money and they're going to start foreclosing? Uh, what are you going to do when you lose your job because somebody lied about you? If you have an understanding and a revelation of your authority in Christ, you'll take authority over those situations. You'll take authority over that sickness and disease that's trying to steal from your child. You'll take authority over the devil who's trying to rob, steal, and kill from you. So I want to encourage you to get the textbook and the workbook. And if you have a Bible study or a life group, use it and find out what your authority is in Christ Jesus. Now, tomorrow we're going to pick up here where we left off. Uh, Jesus uh, was asked to pray for this boy who had... Uh, he was lunatic and uh, vexed of the devil and so forth. And uh, Jesus did pray uh, for them, but he said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I suffer with you or allow you bring him to me? And then he said the same thing that you see recorded in Mark. He said, nothing shall be impossible unto him that believeth. So we're talking about authority, we're talking about identity, and we're talking about power. You have to believe what the Bible says, not what tradition says, not what denominations say, but you have to believe what the Bible says. You have to believe all the gospel to have and exercise all authority. You can't just erase what you don't like or what you don't believe. You believe it all. Join me again tomorrow. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching to. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221, or email Happy Caldwell at VTNTV.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.